Hi, this is Brian Dolan with the law firm Pepper Hamilton. Welcome to this latest Pepper podcast. Joining me today is Pepper partner Andrew Holsch and Eric Sosito of TriCap Partners. We wanted to talk about the investment banker-led auction process today. This was the topic of a breakfast briefing that Eric helped coordinate and Andrew was on the panel for, and this took place in Pepper's New York office this fall. The event included some lively conversation among the panelists and audience members, and we thought some of those insights would be valuable to our podcast listeners today. Eric, I wanted to ask if you can go over some of the questions that were asked during the event for our podcast listeners. Andy, we were fortunate to have a great panel um, with you and some other individuals, with uh, Brett Hickey from Star Capital, with uh, Drew Quigley from Bank of America, and Don Moore from JMP on the topic of, of options. Let's kind of start kind of the uh, big picture and, you know, when we look at the, the um, bank-led options in the market, you know, we're seeing a lot of, um, you know, I would say frothy multiples. We're seeing a lot of uh, competition. Why, why do you think we're seeing that, uh, this market environment today? There's a tremendous amount of capital that is at play looking for deals to invest in. We see this both on the venture side and we see this uh, on the private equity side. In addition, over the past few years, with the accumulation of significant wealth, resulting in part from the, um, the markets and part from the success of private equity firms and their executives, we're seeing uh, family offices emerge as another player in the market for investments and for buyouts. Those factors combined with the access to relatively inexpensive debt capital to layer on top of the equity capital to make the transactions, which is really creating this a market which is you know very heated and seeking deals. So again, it boils down to the very significant amount of capital that there is that's looking to invest in, in equity uh, in equity deals and in investments. So when you look at the auction process today, you've represented plenty of uh, private equity investors in the process. How do you go about approaching entering into a auction process? You know, the first thing a company would do would be to consider engaging a financial advisor. And for some transactions, it doesn't doesn't make sense. For very small transactions, it probably does not make a lot of sense for sort of mid-market and larger transactions, it inevitably makes sense to hire a financial advisor. What a financial advisor will do is it will expose your company and sell your company to numerous investors, both financial buyers such as private equity funds and family offices and strategic buyers uh, such as uh, other companies engaged in the same or similar industry as the company that you're seeking to sell. So what do you think a private equity fund or institutional investor has to do differently today in advance of entering into an option to increase one's uh, probability of success in the process? Okay, so now looking at this from this perspective of a private equity firm, one of the areas that I've been focusing on uh, significantly in the past um, year is on how to help our private equity sponsored clients increasing the likelihood that they will succeed in an auction process. An auction process can be typically characterized by one or two outlying bidders who are willing to pay a substantial premium for the asset, uh, combined with a number of other bidders who generally come in at or around the same valuation. And so the goal, when I advise private equity sponsors, you know, who are our clients as to how they can increase the likelihood of winning an auction, uh, I think you have to assume that the one or two outlier bidders are going to fall away or they're just going to offer so much that they're going to get the asset regardless of what anybody else does. But by and large, most sophisticated buyers of businesses use similar valuation methodology. So what you'll see in, in, in almost all cases is a group of bids that are really close to each other in price. And so um, it's not always in in the seller's best interest to pick the highest bidder. There are a number of other factors that a seller is going to consider. So I have developed a sort of a relatively long list of things that a private equity buyer or family office 
or a strategic buyer can do to increase its odds of winning an auction process. I'll tell you where a few of them are right now. First is making the right presentation. You know, I've seen presentations that are literally a paragraph that say, here's the price we're willing to pay, and that's it. Inevitably, those bids won't win because there's really no substance behind the actual offer. A better offer, and one that is likely to have a greater chance of success, is an offer that describes the history of the bidder. So if I'm representing a private equity sponsor, we're going to want to talk about what their success has been in bids, when they've been selected as the winning bidder based on price, how often have they closed on those bids, because lots of times we'll see a bidder making a high bid, and then once they've been selected, they'll renegotiate. So one of the one of the factors that a, a private equity sponsor can do to increase its chances of success is to uh, show that it has made a bid, which it has won, and that the closing price, the price at which it has ultimately consummated the deal, is close to or at the same price that they bid on. So, for example, I met recently with a large private equity sponsor who told me that in 98% of the transactions where they've selected, they've been selected as a winning bidder, and they gone on to complete the transaction and they completed the transaction within a one to two percent range of the price that they originally bid. So that's a very, very strong factor to consider. Other uh, aspects to consider are knowing your sellers, you know, know your sellers well and structuring your deal thoughtfully. So you may have a seller that is on the fence as to whether or not it really wants to sell, whether this is the right time to exit. That's that's normally the biggest concern of a seller. Uh, should I be selling now or should I wait? So where you have a seller like that, you might want to structure your deal a little bit differently. So for example, you could require the seller to roll over a certain portion of their equity so that they continue to participate in the upside of the business. You may want to structure uh, bonuses and management incentive plans based on the success of the company following the acquisition. You might want to structure a portion of the purchase price as an earn out. All these things are designed to enable the sellers who are somewhat reluctant to actually sell their, their companies to participate in, in the ongoing upside of the company. Now you're touching on, on a few issues that we addressed on the panel a few weeks ago, and I think one of the big takeaways that we had on that panel was, you know, you have uh, a management team uh, as part of this company, and you touched on a little bit in terms of earnouts and uh, and rollovers and stuff like that. But what are the best ways that you think are in terms of dealing with the issue of the management team as part of the uh, the company that's that's up for sale in terms of? keeping them in the process, keeping them part of the company. Do you want them as, as part of the management team? But in general, the management team, how do, you, how do you address that? Well, it depends. So typically when you're representing a strategic buyer, such as an operating company, they are not as insistent as a private equity firm or a financial buyer in retaining key management. Uh, oftentimes an operating company will have their own management team that they'll want to assume the roles of in, in the acquired company. But when we're representing private equity sponsors, it's almost always critical to retain the existing management team, at least for a period of time. And so in those instances, you'll want to identify who the key management players are, who you want to retain, and we'll want to provide appropriate incentives for them to really support the transaction. If you have a situation where one private equity firm is selling its assets and you're representing a private equity buyer, well, the, the private equity buyer is going to want to place appropriate incentives so that management supports the transaction. If management doesn't support the transaction, it's going to be much more difficult to get the transaction done. So uh, things like bonus plans structured around uh, financial metrics and, and performance can be helpful. Uh, the allocation of equity in the acquired company to management can be helpful. Long-term contracts for certain key key members of management can also be helpful to retain to retain management following the, closing the transaction. In this market environment, in this M and A environment, um, you know, we a lot of private equity funds uh, hesitate in terms of getting into options just because of the competitive nature and and the overbidding that can happen. Um, yet at the same time, most of the successful transactions are being done via auctions. So in this kind of market environment, 
is the option process here to stay or how do you view that? I, I don't think private equity sponsors have a choice in the matter. If they want to bid for for assets in the middle market to the upper market in terms of value, then they're going to see most transactions being run through an auction process. They may get lucky and see an occasional transaction on a proprietary basis and pursue that transaction, but by and large, most quality transactions, most quality assets are run through an auction process with a reasonably sophisticated, if not very sophisticated, financial advisor. Andy, one of the issues that you address is, is valuation and the other factors in, in, a, um, in a transaction besides valuation. How, how, do, you, how do you provide advice to um, investors that are about to enter into an auction process, both in terms of approaching valuation and also structure of a transaction? Well, you know, as a lawyer, I, I generally don't get very involved in advising my clients as to valuation methodologies what they should be paying. I do tell them that they, they that by and large they need to be prepared to pay whatever the market is valuing this asset at. Uh, really, the value that I provide is in advising our clients how to structure an offer in an auction process in a way that's likely to achieve greater success. And so I touched upon a few of the things already that I've advised, that I typically advise clients to do, including making the right presentation, knowing your sellers and structuring the deal carefully. But other things that, uh, other aspects of an offer that I, I believe all bidders should consider to increase the likelihood of, that they'll win the auction process are laying out a timetable carefully uh, for the process for example, specify when due diligence will be completed, when the definitive transaction documents and ancillary documents will be prepared, uh, when regulatory filings will be made, when third-party approvals will be sought, and when when they expect the closing to occur. Second, uh, it's, it's always helpful for prospective buyers to develop a relationship with the bankers, with the financial advisors, on a friendly basis, because the, the financial advisor is going to have a lot of influence on the outcome of the entire process. So uh, I always recommend that our clients get to know the bankers pretty well and try to you know, get an understanding of what it is they're looking for above and beyond simply getting the highest bid. And of course, one of the things I mentioned earlier was certainty of closing. So in your offer, you want to specify as, as few conditions to closing as you're comfortable specifying. You know, uh, don't make it an open-ended process with, where you have an absolute ability to walk. Uh, when you're when I, when we're preparing a markup of the purchase agreement for a buyer, you know, I, I tend to advise my clients to focus on what's important. Not everything is important. Not every single representation, warranty, condition, and covenant is critical. So it's better to focus on what is truly critical because if you mar if you provide. 50 comments on every page of a purchase agreement, the buyer, the seller rather, is going to get a sense that that the buyer is not likely to close the transaction, that they're not really that serious, or that there are going to be too many obstacles to overcome. The other things that I typically advise our clients to do are focusing on structuring a transaction in a way that is tax friendly to the sellers as well as the buyer if possible. Uh, in addition, I often suggest that our clients include a covenant to provide representation and warranty insurance in, in the acquisition itself because if you have representation and warranty insurance, that often makes it more likely that a deal will actually close, that the parties won't get hung up on their views of the representations and warranties in the agreement. And finally, um, and, and I'll say this again, only because I think it's really the most important factor. I believe that if you, if a buyer can show its track record in behaving well in auctions, that will be the most helpful of all. If, if it can show that it has been the winning bidder on 10 auctions in the last three years, and that it has gone on to complete all of those transactions, that's gonna carry a lot more weight. Their offer is gonna carry a lot more weight than a competing bidder who has won 10 auctions and gone on to close only one or two or a handful of the deals. Well, great. Well, I think that's a great summary of the event that we held here two weeks ago. 
and uh, look forward to uh, the next one. Thanks, Eric. For our listeners, if you enjoyed this conversation, I would encourage you to visit Pepper's Insight Center at our website, www.pepperlaw.com, for more information on topics like this.